he, he became a Ministry of uh, Education and University as well. Uh, so for me, was, this was a shock because having somebody from a big growth uh, community into the Italian government was, uh, you know, it was incredible. And uh, so I asked Lorenzo today to uh, give an introduction about his work and his experience of being within the institution and also the challenges. No? And so the idea is that we have this uh, informal conversation. If, you, if you're OK, we can record for our purpose. And, and then you can decide if uh, the things that you say can be, can be public or not. <laughs> you decide. You will be free. And, and then, then we have a discussion. We can have a discussion. Here we have a very heterogeneous group. As I told you, I, I got this uh, ERC starting grant based on uh, post-growth innovation. So we are here, there are economies, there are STS people, people studying science technology studies. Uh, there are people from history studies, humanity. So we're a very diverse group. And the things that we have in common here is that uh, the enthusiasm of imagining a world post that is not obsessed with economic growth, right? Like a post-growth or also a degrowth world. Okay, so the floor is yours. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Mario. Thank you for having me. Um, just to give me a thumbs up if you can hear me loud and clear. Um, good, good. And I envy you guys. It's freezing where I am. That's why I'm wearing this super puffy uh, sweater. Um, I take it it's informal, right? Usually I'm, I do this stuff in, in a jacket and a shirt. But today I thought it was informal enough. So uh, thank you for um, for inviting me to this uh, conversation. I'm going to I'm going to speak for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then we do a Q&A. How, how does that work? Is that OK, Mario? OK. Um, OK, good. Um, so um, as Mario said, uh, I've been a professor of political economy now for uh, more than 10 years. And um, and then over the past three years, I was uh, I got on leave from my academic position and I became a member of parliament. Uh, I'm still a member of parliament and I was uh, deputy minister, minister of education, university and research for two years uh, in the previous Italian governments. I'm no longer. Um, OK, so most of my work has been on um, if you study degrowth, if you're interested in degrowth, if you're interested in, in the critique of economic growth, you have come across my name at some point. If you haven't, then, then that means you're, you're, you know, you're not ready to, to complete your studies yet. Um, I started um, working on I'm an economic historian by um, by uh, training. And I started writing about the history of economic indicators um, after my PhD, so in the late two, first decade of 2000. And then I published a book that uh, Mario mentioned, Gross Domestic Problem, The Politics Behind the World's Most Powerful Number in 2012. Um, and it's, it was the first book ever that told basically the economic history of GDP. And, and, um, and then there have been other books, right? Um, I think all in all, five or six books have been written on the topic by economic historians, and mine was the first one. Um, and so my initial critique was that if we understood the economic history of GDP, we would also understand what are the economic interests behind that model, was gaining, was not gaining, was benefiting from it, and, and also why it is so hard to move beyond the GDP. Um, I collaborated, I've been collaborating since the very beginning with the Italian Statistical Office, the South African uh, Statistical Office, the, Statistical, the, the, the Bureau of Economic Analysis in the US, so the Department of Commerce, and, and other statistical offices. So I come from that kind of background, you know, analyzing indicators and developing indicators. And, and over time, I realized that we needed um, somehow also a theoretical framework that would bring most of this work together with the idea of having policy impact. So I came across, of course, the growth. Um, I, before I met Mario, I met all the other forefathers of the growth from Serge Latouche to uh, Martinez Allier to, um, you know, some of the key proponents of the initial thinking around the growth. And then also I got to work with um, the world's most famous ecological econo economists like Herman Daly, Robert Costanza. You must have come across some of these names, people working on, you know, the genuine progress indicator and the whole critique in the steady state economy and so on and so forth. So then I thought, 
at some point, I, 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 my sense was that we needed something that could bring all these strands of work together and turn them into a narrative that could have an impact. One of my main critiques of degrowth, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with all the proponents of degrowth, but I think degrowth as a concept has a number of limitations. First of all, its name. I think its name doesn't simply work. Um, its name still refers to growth as a reference point. Its name is perceived as a negative. Um, and this goes back to my initial conversations with Martinez Allier and many others. It's perceived as a negative, so it doesn't travel well. You know, tra the traveling of concepts is extremely important. If you want your ideas to become global, you need to propose ideas that resonate not only in Barcelona, not only in Paris, not only in, in Cadiz or uh, in, in London, but also in Papua New Guinea, also in Africa, also in South America. And it's very hard for those like me who lived for 20 years in the African continent to talk about degrowth with people that have never seen growth in the first place, right? So it's it's in a sense, I know you're familiar with some of these critiques, right? You know, it's 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 a very bourgeois privilege to be able to talk about degrowth when you haven't, you know, when you have seen a lot of growth and you have all the, the nice infrastructure that then allows you to say, you know what, I'm gonna take a walk in the park or I'm gonna reduce consumption because I already have seen what consumption does. And, and I think it's a limit, it's a, it's a serious conceptual limitation to do what some of the key propo current proponents of degrowth um, are doing, um, like, um, like Jason, for instance, um, in London, um, who say that degrowth is mostly a recipe for the developed economies, and while the other economies should be allowed to grow, and, and, and we, should, we should contract so that the others can grow. Because I think growth is wrong in general the way it is we shouldn't simply say we need to degrow because we have grown and let the others grow to have their own uh, you know slice of the cake um, if we critique growth as as a recipe for development then we should actually invite all the other countries not to grow in the first place but what do we propose for countries that haven't grown okay i, I put it very in a probably in a complex way i don't want to lose your attention but basically my sense was that degrowth wasn't working Steady state economy wasn't working either, too complex, too complicated, too academic. It wasn't moving far. Um, all the other attempts at moving beyond GDP were wishy-washy, you know, were very superficial. We're not really looking at tackling the, the root causes of our problems. So in 2015, I came up with this idea of a well-being economy, right? An economy based on well-being. And the very simple idea is that growth if you, if you if you know um, Tim Jackson's work, you would know that you know growth is conceived as a means to an end, right? We need to grow in order to achieve a better quality of life. This was the initial approach, but over time, growth became an end in itself. So my idea was that what if we go back to measuring the actual outcomes? So what if we can measure the performance of an economy not by how much it grows, but how well it does in terms of um, different dimensions of well-being? And if you look at medical science, biological reports, and so on and so forth, we know that our well-being as humans is mostly derived by three, you know, looking at three dimensions. Our personal health, which in a sense is, is also connected to the others. The quality of our social connections, so social cohesion, social relations, and the quality of our ecosystems. We benefit from living in healthy ecosystems, right? So our personal and collective well-being is directly dependent on the quality of society, our personal body, physical, uh, physical health, and 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 the environment. So my sense was, my proposal was, we need to start measuring macroeconomic systems, microeconomic systems. So the country as a whole, as much as an enterprise, based on the outcomes rather than the the transactions and the means to achieve those outcomes. Um, of course, in the 1930s, when they invented the national statistical systems and they invented the systems of production and uh, production account, production and consumption accounts, and so on and so forth, they didn't know how to measure well-being. But now we have made incredible inroads into the statistical knowledge and statistical systems. So unlike 100 years ago, now we can do that. So they invented the statistical systems in order to get a sense of what could be measured as a proxy to, as a, proxy to a good economy. But now we can actually do better and skip the skip skip the proxy and go straight to the measurement of the outcomes. So, and by doing so, 
of course, we have proposed a completely a complete overhaul of the concept of growth. Uh, we argued, uh, the well-being economy proponents argue that we do need, um, you know, an economy that produces negative externalities is an inefficient economy, an economy that is not producing well-being, it's undermining well-being. So every time you have negative outcomes in your production and consumption process, you are taking wealth away from society. So you can only grow, you can only develop when you're activities are regenerating natural systems and are having a positive impact on society. Here again, there's a slight difference with degrowth. Uh, you know, we argue, for instance, that negative growth per se doesn't tell us anything about whether this is going to have a good impact on personal health and, and natural ecosystems. You may have a country that degrows and does very badly in terms of social cohesion and, and, um, and natural systems. So we argue that Rather than having an economy that disengages, that contracts per se, we want an economy that while contracting is regenerating, while contracting in terms of GDP, it's regenerating in terms of many other dimensions of well-being. So it needs to be a proactive approach to creating a different type of value, not simply disengaging, not a negative one, but a positive one. And we've also seen that it works extremely well when it comes to um, convincing other countries to do so. When you talk about well-being outcomes and you go to Zambia, people listen. People are keen to know what it means to be a company that is producing well-being. It's not producing, uh, you know, like it's per perhaps reducing its 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 profit in terms of of uh, conventional growth approaches, but it's at the same time putting into practice mechanisms and systems that increase the well-being of everyone around the company, of the natural systems, and so on and so forth. So they're keen to do that. Uh, concepts like Ubuntu, Buen Vivir, so, uh, Sufficiency, and um, Lagom in Sweden, in many different cultures, there is a continuous reference to well-being as to living well as the final outcome of all our societal processes. So it travels pretty well, not only in industrialized nations, but also in less industrialized nations. And we feel this is 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 more policy relevant if we want to translate to turn ideas into practice. More recently, in 2017, five countries, um, Scotland, New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, and Wales, have decided to adopt the well-being economy as their main macroeconomic policy framework. So now they're drafting their budget laws. You may well know that in 2019, New Zealand changed the name of the budget law into the well-being budget law. So it's the first country that put well-being into the national name of the budget law. And all the other countries are doing the same. You know, all the other countries have introduced well-being indicators. Many of them have questioned the relevance of GDP. Some of them have actually sidelined GDP altogether. They have not excluded it yet, but it's a pretty, you know, it's pretty advanced when you consider when you consider that it's so hard to get rid of this indicator. And they're measuring in them, um, the, the effectiveness of economic policies based on that. We made some progress also in Italy. It's not not satisfactory yet. We do have well-being indicators to to draft the budget law and to assess the effectiveness of the budget law, but it's still not so relevant compared to how significant GDP is in, in, the, in, in the drafting of the national budget law in Italy. Um, but this tells us, I mean, imagine if you could, you know, having five countries that have signed up to this idea of going away from GDP and moving on to well-being, imagine if degrowth, uh, you know, like for, post, for the post-growth movement, I think it's, it's a significant sign of success to a certain, to a certain extent. And, I've, and I'm closing, almost, and um, when I became a politician, I realized how important it is to have a concept that works well in science, but also works well in society. Um, it's really hard to talk about um, post-growth in policy circles. It's easy for us as academics. We're much better understood and as students, you know, it's, it flies okay, especially within certain academic circles. Um, I don't know how many of you come from mainstream economics, but speaking about degrowth in mainstream economics is extremely, extremely hard yet. And, um, but when it comes to the policy realm, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the situation changes altogether. Um, for me, it was really hard to go on TV uh, and talk about some of these concepts and being accused of being the degrowther, right? I mean, do, and probably Mario watches Italian TV as well. And, uh, you know, the concept of decrescita is is used as as um, 
as an accusation, as an insult, right? You know, and uh, we in Italy, we we were had for some time a movement called Happy Degrowth, and and I think I'm very I'm a very good friend um, of of the of the inspirator of that movement, Maurizio Pallante, but that concept has been manipulated by the media as an insult to simply dis- disregard and disqualify any any opinion that is critical of growth. They basically uh, accuse you of being yet another lofty, happy degrowth person, right? And that disqualifies you as you were as if you were an idiot, right? Someone that doesn't understand anything about economics. So that's why when I got into politics, I got even more convinced that the fact that my book was titled The Wellbeing Economy, it was translated in Italian into Italian with the title An Economy to Live Well. Um, was easier for me to be seen as credible, was easier for me to be listened to because I wasn't coming across as someone proposing to reduce our GDP, but I was coming across as someone proposing to move away from GDP altogether and reconceptualize growth and development in terms of well-being rather than increasing transactions. And, And that resonates extremely much more positively with the media, with the public, with uh, other political parties and with, um, uh, with um, um, enterprises and companies and the you know market operators, but I think you know if we're not able to convince those that are operating in the market, uh, it's going to be very hard for us to to turn our ideas into something into something practical. And when I was minister, um, even even then, it was really hard to 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 make them understand what that meant in practice. Let me give you two examples. When I became a minister, the first thing I proposed was to introduce. Uh, fiscal reform, a new taxation system that would basically sanction negative externalities on health and the environment. So my proposal was if a company is producing negative health outcomes, let's say the food industry, junk food, sugary food, and so on and so forth, they need to be sanctioned, right? You need to increase taxes on the products that are um, undermining our health. And Italy has seen a, a, a sudden growth over the past 10 to 15 years in terms of uh, child obesity, um, metabolic diseases, diabetes, and so on and so forth, a bit like the Mexicans and the Americans. So we are going away from being a, 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 a nation with a relatively good diet, healthy diet, it was um, 20 years ago, to a nation that is using a lot of junk food and eating a lot, especially the younger generations. Consider, again, as an anecdote, that Italy's richest man is Ferrero, right? The, the, the person that produces junk food for children. And and it's quite common for Italian children um, to, 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 to go to school and eat junk food at school, right? I mean, like, and so as a minister of education, I banned all junk food from schools. All the dietary regulations in schools were extremely strict, only healthy, locally produced food. And so then I proposed these fiscal reforms, increasing tax revenues from from airlines, flights, unnecessary flights, meaning the flights that are nationally uh, on a national level so that you could actually take a train for. Similar proposals were made in France by the Greens in Germany. Probably you've come across, I don't know whether in Spain you've got something similar, but it wouldn't surprise me if you did. And those proposals were heavily attacked by the media. Again, I, you know, it's even though I was coming from a well-being economy perspective, some of those and 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 explaining that what you lose in terms of profit, of monetary profit, you gain in terms of uh, well-being outcomes, right? So it was a positive for society. You you gain in terms of tax, and you gain in terms of positive outcomes. Even though, so all the econometric. Uh, work was was pretty thorough that we did in order to demonstrate that society had to gain from in in, in these sanctions and taxations. Um, it was extremely hard to do so. The law was then approved and then suspended because of COVID allegedly, but ever since hasn't been uh, reintegrated. So Italy now has a new tax system, especially on sugary drinks, that has been suspended uh, due to the pandemic. But it's not being restated <laughs> since since it was so it's it's never it's never come into effect. And also, as a minister, I um, introduced mandatory education on climate change and sustainable development and well-being practices in schools. So now all the kids in Italy, from grade one all the way to the end of high school, are 
learning are doing what we call green civic education. They're doing civic education, but with a green approach. So trying to be active citizens when it comes to changing your consumption patterns, eating properly, buying local, trying to be active in your community, install, installing PV panels on the rooftops of your schools and trying to explain to mom and dad how to be more responsible citizens when it comes to social, uh, you know, social cohesion and, and environmental sustainability. So again, that was uh, also uh, initially um, uh, received with a bit of resistance by many, many parties, especially conservative parties, but then it was easier to to adopt it um, through you know convincing and showing and showing strong arguments for that and I think one of the main reasons why I think that education in this regard is extremely useful it is not only because of course it changes our way of thinking right and I think for as long as we have economists that go to university and are taught that growth is good and there is no alternative to growth for as long as we go to university and engineers are told that they have to build bridges without any consideration for the environmental impact and so on and so forth. For as long as we're told uh, when you go to medical school that all you need to do is to save a person's life and disregard what it means in terms of well-being, how to live well rather than how to postpone death, which should be the main preoccupation of a medical doctor, it shouldn't be about postponing death, but about making people live well and therefore focusing much more on preventing sicknesses, on, on avoiding therapies unless they're really necessary and so on and so forth. We're never going to get to the kind of post-growth society that we are aspiring to achieve. But also, education is so critical because it affects the immediate behavior of children. And when you, when you, you empower children to change their consumption behavior, when you empower them to make a difference now, not only when they're going to become adults, but now you're empowering them to be change makers in the family and they affect the behavior of the family and they affect the behavior of the relatives and they affect the behavior of the communities and the church and the associations and so on and so forth. So my current uh, major objective at the global level is to pursue this global agenda that I'm doing with Malala, the Nobel Prize winner, um, the Pakistani Nobel Prize winner, you probably know her. I'm doing it with Malala. I'm doing it with um, uh, two former ministers of education of Tunisia and and the UK. I'm doing it with the Brookings Institutions, Education International, the Education Outcomes Fund, and so on and so forth. That is to make it a global mandate that kids have to go to school and learn green civic education with the view to affecting the behavior, the consumption behavior of billions of people now. It is, according to our studies, there's a beautiful report by the Brookings Institutions that we commissioned uh, last year that says that if you want to have the most significant impact on cutting carbon emissions now, not in 20 years, but now you teach children how to be green civic activists and they're going to be go, they're going to go back home and they're going to basically contaminate their consumption behaviors at home and so on and so forth. And that's the easiest way to reach 80 to 90 percent of the global population. Um, and that is, according to our estimates, even more significant than a massive rollout of wind turbine, turbines and PV panels and renewable energies in terms of cutting down carbon emissions now. Because at the end of the day, and here I'm really closing, Mario, at the end of the day, um, it is the consumption behavior that we need to change, right? I mean, we need to find a way of getting 9 million people to, change, to, to adopt different, um, different lifestyles and to, to influence the companies and so on and so forth to influence the governments to demand change from their governments. And we think that through education, we could within one to two years build from the bottom up that's that demand for transformation and that practice of transformation, which is so desperately needed nowadays. And of course, this is the bottom up. We continue doing the policy pressures from from above and then we creating the sort of sandwich model, which is uh, you know what i describe in this book the, the world after gdp i don't know if you've come across another book uh, that i wrote in 2017 and my argument is that you can only transform the economy when you've got these two sides connecting to one another for as long as you only have policy proponents without demand or activists without policy leadership you're always going to there's, there's always going to be a mismatch what we need now is to have these two sides meet i've learned the hard way that you can be the most progressive politician in the whole world if people don't understand what you're proposing, you're going to be a failure. 
And this is one of the reasons why I think geek growth hasn't gone anywhere in politics, because there were all oh, brilliant people, excellent people, smart people. Then they went to elections, then they got zero, zero comma zero, zero, zero percent of the votes. We need to find a way to educate the demand side for policy transformation. And I think through education is a powerful tool to do that. Done. <laughs> wow. Uh, can you hear me from here? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very well. Yeah. Uh, whoa, this was uh, you know mind blowing. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. And uh, a lot of things, a lot of topics, a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions here, but you know I will limit for one. Uh, first of all, I had this conversation with the city council in Pontevedra. We um, they are a very left wing uh, administration. And um, the people in NICTA and Barcelona asked me to organize the uh, International Conference on Degrowth here in Pontevedra. And they said yes to everything. But uh, please, in 2023, we will have uh, a new campaign. Uh, so we want to be reelected. Don't use degrowth as a slogan. <laughs> use well being. Because we are really sympathetic. We, we are support. Uh, but this is not a, a, a you know a slogan that works when you are trying to convince people. Right wing people here are voting for the mayor, left wing mayor because of the person. Yeah. You know? So this uh, this city, this town is is very conservative, but for some like a very like a magic of, of, of politics now they are supporting a very left wing administration, and the results are visible. I mean this town is like. There is basically literally no cars in the center, and uh, the quality of life is very high. So this is the first anecdote. The question, which is a very big question, and of course you're going to have to answer now, but just a provocation. I, I agree with most of what, what you say, but I have a more provoking question, which is, do you think it's possible such a transformation maintaining the social order and the social structure? Because many people in the degrowth or in the critical theory uh, uh, spectrum or even post-growth are thinking that uh, the economy, the way we organize, for example, technology, we are very focusing on technology in this project, is just a reflection of certain values that are reflected also into the social structure. So in other words, it is possible this, trans this transition if we keep stuck on capitalism, so it <laughs> is no, no, possible, possible within capitalism. So this is a very big question. Uh, I don't know if you want to answer or give your idea here, or we can collect those questions. Or I think we got like a big question. To okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Give me, let's, give me let's, your opinion. We have your quick opinion on this, and then we can move on. Sure. Let's let's break the ice with the first question. Uh, thank you, Mario, um, and thank you for mentioning the totally understandable concern of the local mayor. That's exactly what happens. You know, like you got people that think the way you think that are getting it, but they are policy smart, right? Academics tend not to be policy smart, okay? So that's why when they, with a few exceptions, hopefully me, but I'm not sure, when they turn into politicians, they fail. Um, but the fact that I'm no longer the Minister of Education may be an indication that I'm also a policy failure. So um, his concern is absolutely understandable, and and uh, and it's it, it, it sort of attests to what I was saying earlier. I I believe we need to go. We, we you know in, this process will produce a a a profound shift in capitalism, and I think um, you know we're going to create an economic system that is post-capitalist in many different ways. But I think it's a mistake to let the capitalists understand that we are demanding the end of capitalism. So I think in a sense, the well-being economy narrative is very subtle. It's alluring, it's pleasing, and as it gets in, it changes capitalism without capitalists recognizing that. Because if you upfront, you're saying to capital, you know, to those that believe, that believe, you know, believe in capitalism, that, you know, you want, to change capitalism and all of that, the reaction is, oh, okay, here we have another communist. And, and I think you need to be much more subtle and smart. So I, I usually present the well-being economy as 
the virus that changes capitalism without capitalists um, realizing that. A. B. Um, that will probably definitely change the social structure of our society. I think when you start, I think it's inherent in the whole concept of well being. When you start understanding, for instance, that the time has got different value than what the capitalist uh, obsession with growth, which is not just capitalist. I mean, economic historians know that growth is not just a byproduct of, of capitalism. It is actually even worse than socialism. I'd like to remind everyone that the indicator used by the Soviet Union to measure uh, economic performance was called actually material consumption, right? So they didn't even consider immaterial consumption, the services and all of that. For them, it was actually making bricks, you know? The more bricks you made, the more developed you were. And this was communism. And it makes a lot of sense in, in, the, in, in, the, Marxian, in the Marxist approach to, um, to the economy. So um, when you start realizing that time, for instance, is valuable in many different ways, also free time is valuable, uh, time that you spend uh, with your, your friends and your connections, you're creating social cohesion, you're adding to social capital, you're generating all positive outcomes for society. That changes the way we understand work. That changes the way in which we understand productive in, in relations in a society. That changes the way in which we understand, you know, company business to business uh, interactions and so on and so forth. When you realize that, uh, you know, like ec ecosystems are by themselves adding value by keeping them intact, they're adding value to everything in terms of well-being, everything that we do, that changes completely our approach vis-a-vis -vis nature, which is now only valued when it's exploited. And again, this was the same for socialism as it was for capitalism. So I think when you, when you do that, you are shifting societal relations, societal habits, the, the social structure is inevitably. Uh, that's, that's my sense. But if you, um, I don't know how to put it. If you, um, well, there's another element which I think is also very interesting. I think that technology has a double-edged sword. Um, a lot of the technology that the growth mechanism, the growth system has produced, can also be used against growth. And I think this is happening. I mean, many of our interactions now happen virtually, right? And and this has lowered our material consumption on many different levels. We can do, we we may be able to do even better. Uh, every time I see a new frontier broken in the sector of additive technology. I think that now finally we have managed, we, we're getting close to building a, a system of production which is going to be customized, which is going to be basically the end of mass consumption and mass production. Potentially we're going to be able to have a new model of production whereby we produce what we need and not what we don't need. We can re reuse um, everything and fix everything. So the fix the society of fixable objects is now uh, within reach. Something that up until a few years ago was impossible. Um, to even think about it, I mean, the concept of economies of scale is being absolutely uh, brought into question by the economy of uh, personalization and customization. Why should you produce? mass a mass of objects when you can only you can produce what is needed when it's needed by who needs it um and and when you can produce something that can be fixed can be upgraded can be reused completely and doesn't uh expire within a conventional business cycle a year a year or two years which is the case for most gadgets most gadgets and and the mass production system so again i think that if we use the technology um, the technology argument for using it strategically we can create contraction by generating well-being outcomes by not refrain by not rejecting technology but by embracing the technology that helps us achieve those results again here again i see the degrowth message and some of the other messages around degrowth weak on technology right it seems they seem to be more indicating that what we need is to reject technology. And if we, re do we, do we think that we're going to really be able to do so if we reject technology? If we reject technology, what's going to happen? Is that going to lead to a contraction in terms of consumption when there is technology that now can finally help us do certain things that we couldn't do 20 years ago? Um, why should I reject, you know, PV panels? Why should I reject the technology that makes me produce PV panels at home? Up until 20 years ago, I needed to buy PV panels from China. Now I can produce them locally. Why should I do that? Why should I reject technology that helps me stay at home and work from home without having 
to commute back and forth to the office? Why should I reject technology that helps me reduce you know, pre precision agriculture? Precision agriculture is a new frontier. If I can produce more food with less impact on the environment by using the knowledge that I have by satellites and so on, why should I, re why should I reject that when I can actually achieve the outcome that up until 20 years ago was seem seeming impossible and therefore industrial farming seemed to be the only way to produce food. Again, these are just examples of the technological revolution that is heavily impacting on well-being if used purposely. I agree with you. If not used purposefully, purposefully then we go towards a totally different uh, outcome. Automation society and you know the age of robots and you name it. But if used purposefully, I think some of these technologies can really empower uh, what I call the post-industrial artisans. We can actually start building millions and millions of small local <clears throat> enterprises that are local, operate locally, responsibly, but with global knowledge, with global innovation. And I think that is a new frontier in, 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 in building a well-being economy. Yeah, and this is also one of the main topic of uh, Prospera, our project. Okay, wow. Uh, excuse me, I will... Uh, ask first our females uh, components because otherwise it's like a manner here and we don't want to create this. So Sophia, Joe, and then Ben. And then you. Okay. Oh, Sophia, Joe. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I'm Sophia. Um, as you know, when forming a concept, it's incredibly important to um, have a visual element, whether this is um, an image or metaphor that distills it. Uh, to market it to as many people as possible. Um, equally, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with this um, when you simplify a concept. And I think you used the idea of a sandwich. Um, I just wondered what symbol or image do you think best represents the well-being economy? Uh, did you have, have you used multiple images and did you come up with them yourself? Okay, um, yes, uh, we do have a a, a representation, an illustration, which we call the well-being infinity loop. Uh, you know the sign of infinity? It's like this, right? And um, it's it's a bit of a, if you think about the donut, right? You're all familiar with the donut. Um, our main, just like we're critical of the VD growth, but again, it's a criticism out of love, right? I mean, it's a, it's a criticism from within, okay? I don't want to antagonize anyone, uh, you know, it's in the same happens with Kate Rayworth. I think her work is extremely productive and extremely useful. But in both cases, the emphasis seems to be on what you give up more than more than what you gain, right? This is this is to me crucial, right? Even the concept of degrowth per se is already indicating, uh, you know, something that you give up rather than it's the focus is on what you give up rather than what you gain. And I, th I think the same happens with the donut. If you think about the donut, the donut says a good economy has to stay within limits. Planetary boundaries should be shouldn't be exceeded. Social ceiling shouldn't be exceeded either because otherwise you get into deprivation and poverty. So it's an act of balancing between two things that we conceive as being at odds with one another. And I think the donut keeps reinforcing that stigma that social development and environmental sustainability are incompatible with one another. So you need to you need to balance this very tenuous relationship. I think the well-being economies does the opposite. The well-being economy says that if we do well, we can increase our social well-being while generating environmental well-being at the same time. So we can actually add to both. We shouldn't just, uh, you know, just refrain from expanding ourselves socially. When you do that in terms of well-being, you can expand yourself socially by adding to the regeneration of natural ecosystems at the same time. I mean, when ants, just to give you a very simple example, when ants multiply, they don't endanger their ecosystems. They live in harmony with their ecosystems, right? So I think, in a sense, we need to get out of this perception that we that our our development is at odds with the natural with the natural ecosystems. And that in the infinity loop that I've just described is like a spy, like a DNA. Um, Alec, if you know what I mean. So it shows that if you change your modes of production, your way of measuring performance and change the way in which material consumption and production happen, you can increase social well-being by regenerating environmental well-being and in turn environmental well-being will add to social well-being and so on. So you're getting into this upward spiral. 
And I think this is much more useful to countries to show that they're growing. You know, in the future, I'd like them to talk about this kind of growth, this kind of growth, rather than the GDP growth. A growth that is linked to how well they do in terms of making social development expansion, enriching ecosystems, and how to you make sure that ecosystems enrichment is adding to social development expansion, rather than seeing these two things that being at odds with one another. So that's the illustration that we use in order to try and explain how we intend to change the way in which we measure performance, how we you know, design the fiscal system, and how we change business operations, societal consumption, and so on and so forth, in order to create this more harmonious relationship between the two. Our sense is that both degrowth and donut economics are still seeing and, and are still proposing something that basically says, if you know the planet was infinite, we could have expanded socially and had done everything and so on and so forth, and it would have been fantastic, but guess what? The planet is not infinite, so we have to restrain ourselves. Our argument is not at all. Even if the planet was infinite, we would have needed to be in harmony because our social development cannot happen without an harmonious, harmonious relationship with natural ecosystems. Yeah, thank you. And, and it's interesting that uh, the, the logo of Prospera is a double helix, a Celtic double helix, which is a symbol that uh, means flourishing. And we are based in Galicia, and you can find this symbol everywhere in, in ruins or in, in stones in the middle of the forest and something like that. So it's like Perfect. double, uh, like, like double sp sp spirals, no? Like, yeah. like this. Oh, uh, Joe? Uh, can you give me a okay pen from? I, I can hear you, yeah. Not super well, but I can hear you. Okay. Um, I mean, you mentioned Scotland as an example of a well-being economy. Um, yeah, and like kind of following on from Maya's question, yeah, the well-being economy, how they are presented in the UK and in Scotland at the moment, is very capitalist and is still based on economic growth, actually. Wales is a bit different, where they don't actually mention economic growth in their policies anymore. But Scotland and the UK is still very much, you know, very much pursuing the capitalist system. And like, I feel like I was missing in your presentation talking about like dematerialization and like the way that like the well-being economy is very much a, in the UK at least, a fluffy way of kind of like using the capitalist system to prop it up and shape it around well-being. If that makes sense. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. It does. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, well, first of all, I didn't say that Scotland was an example of well-being economy. I said that Scotland and the other countries have adopted well-being economy narratives in how they proceed when it comes to um, the budget law and and economic policy. There's no, there's not one single country in the whole world as an example of a well-being economy. Unfortunately, I think it's still you know, but it's it's a good indication that at least it's moving, it, some countries are moving in, in a direction. Um, and I never said that you know, a well-being economy is in, in the way in which it's presented, it's overly anti-capitalist. That's something you would also probably not find anywhere in the world. There is a beautiful TED talk by Nicola Sturgeon, I'm sure you've, you've seen it, uh, in which she says exactly what I said during this call. She said, we need to move beyond GDP, and we're moving beyond GDP. We need to get rid of X, Y, and Z. And so she's giving an, a sense of direction. Now, whether that is something that happens tomorrow or happens within a few months or years, it's still it's to be seen. Um, very different from England. I think England is a total different story. We have no connections. I think they've been using the term well-being, not well-being economy, well-being as a way of selling, even just David Cameron used to do that, as a way of selling a lot of things that have got nothing to do with the well-being economy. But Scotland and Wales are the two countries that officially have signed up the well-being economy manifesto and they're using it. So I don't vouch for what is happening in the in England, but I, but I can say that Scotland and Wales are moving in that direction. Again, Scotland is a country that comes from a history of industrial oppression, which is probably one of the worst in the world, right? I mean, like it's it's a country of miners, it's a country of heavy industries. And even the fact that a country like that has made commitments when it comes to reducing carbon emissions, which are quite advanced, 
when it comes to um, the national budget law, when it comes to economic policies, I think is a good indication of how this works. Um, of course, you have a country like New Zealand that has done much better. <laughs> You've got Iceland that has done much, much better. You've got Finland that has done, has done much better. Finland has proposed the reduction of the work week based on the well-being economy, the fact that we need to work less to work better. Um, again, politics is full of some of these contradictions. You propose something, then there is a clash, there's a, either you meet a clash, there is um, a backlash, um, the prime minister changes. So it's it's very uncertain in terms of its evolution. But I think these countries are showing that some of these concepts, which are very similar, if not the same concepts of degrowth, can infiltrate these public institutions and become more, more acceptable. Uh, again, without waging a war against capitalism or without um, demanding an altogether restructuring of the entire society, which, as we know, would hardly happen within our time frame. Maybe, maybe it will, I don't know. But so far, I haven't seen a lot of evidence of this happening. Um, so that is, that is um, I think that would be my, 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 answer, my answer to you. Um, again, but maybe here I'm wrong. I still see this as the most significant evidence of some ideas getting into public administration from the post-growth um, from the post-growth front than in the cases of any other. I don't know which which country has ever said we're going to be a steady state economy. I don't know which country has ever said we're espousing degrowth tenets. I don't know which country has ever said. Uh, wow. We're gonna become, you know, maybe maybe some some, and, you know, and those that have done so. I mean, I lived for twenty years, well, two years in Venezuela, did exactly the opposite. I mean, Hugo Chavez, when he was talking about post-capitalism, he was actually establishing one of the most corrupt and resource-intensive governments of history. You know, like uh, and polluting and and so on and so forth. So, I think looking at the practicalities, I think some of these countries are. Costa Rica being another country that has signed up to the manifesto, for instance, are working hard to make a difference which is real, not just the difference that is propaganda. Yeah, thank you. And then there is all, always the risk of cooptation. No? There is like a... Sure. Don't take the question uh, away. Uh, Don't take my question away. No, no, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, my question is on that. Ah, ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> so, then let, him ask, let him ask the question. Um, yeah, before I ask the question, I just wanted to, to like make one clarification. I found it quite interesting that you spoke about the Soviet Union as socialism or like an alternative to capitalism. And maybe something to take on board is like that you can interpret the Soviet Union and the so-called socialist states very easily as state capitalism that still functioned on the modus operandi of capital accumulation. So maybe that can be a more nuanced view. Um, but my question goes in the direction of cooperation in the sense that looking at the well-being economy and coming from a degrowth but also social, ecological, economics background, um, that I would say like all the stuff that I've read from the well-being economy looks like to a certain extent like the concept of a passive revolution, like that you do not address the political economy of the capitalist system. So I'm saying you're the capitalist system, not the capitalist economy. Um, so basically, Clive Spash, I don't know if you're familiar with that particular work, would label it as growth apologetic because actually it is in a huge danger of cooptation because it does not address the political economy of the system that actually produces economic growth. So the root cause that we have is actually not economic growth, but capital accumulation and the system that runs on capital accumulation that creates growth. Um, so, and we can see that in material, and I'm coming back here to Joe, and that has been published in the UK by the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, for example, on business uh, and how businesses can be part of a well-being economy that basically reads like greenwashing and eco-efficiency nonsense. So the cooptation has already taken place and maybe also like your examples of like countries adopting well-being economy indicators is maybe particularly a sign of that, that is already being co-opted because it can be co-opted by capitalist states. So are you actually achieving what you want to achieve if you follow this passive revolutionary path? 
I think so. I think we're achieving what has never been achieved so far by at least 50 years of thinking in these in, in this field, right? I mean, there's been, um, you know, post-capitalist um, theories have, are as old as capitalism and, um, uh, you know, some of these concepts, eco-socialism and so on and so forth, coming from the 70s, I don't know, I'd be happy, happy to say, look, let's be eco-socialists if you could give me one example of where it worked and, and at least that 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 had a policy impact and it didn't so i'm um, since i don't believe i'm more intelligent or we are more intelligent than our friends in the 70s if they didn't succeed in the 70s why should we succeed now with the same ideas the same language um again i think you change capitalism by not letting capitalists realize that i think you change capitalism with businesses i i'm fond of amartya sen when he used to say the market is not just the multinational corporation that you're fighting against is also the lady selling bananas on the streets. It's the farmer selling tomatoes at the local market. And those that are against the market are against the local farmers too. So it's 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 very naive in the 21st century to use a language which we have understood is not appropriate to understand the differences of uh, distribution of forces in society, right? We lump everything together. This is a big mistake. It's a huge mistake. You know, family business, that is producing the, the bread that I that I consume with my family and that I'm selling my tomatoes to is market, is business. But it's not Nestle, it's not Coca-Cola, it's not Apple. And when we lump all of this together, we're simply using a rhetoric of 40, 50 years ago, which didn't succeed then when it was pretty majoritarian because it was extremely popular. It won't succeed now when it's, it's very, very minoritarian. Um, I don't think that's cooptation. I think it may be the other way around. It may be that you're infiltrating um, some of these organizations with very, very revolutionary concepts. You have to gauge the extent to which we all is being co-opted or the other way around. We all, I mean, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, of which I've been uh, the main promoter, um, in terms of what it achieves and in what it does with businesses, not the other way around. You know, when we talk obviously about going beyond growth, doing away with growth, replacing growth with well-being, measuring outcomes in a different ways, rewarding companies in a different ways, having fiscal reforms that are taxing negative externalities, something that has never happened in the in history, you know, like something a fiscal reform that is in line with climate science and so on and so forth. I think it's business being co-opted by well-being activists in a sense, you know, like if they sign up to that, then they're radically transforming themselves and some of them will disappear. Some of them will have to, will go belly up and, and some others will oppose this. And when I was a minister and I proposed these things, they were not soft with me. You know, I was, I actually got three um, uh, judicial uh, processes on my, on my case because Three companies, including ENI, which is the main uh, oil company in Italy, probably have come across as the fifth or sixth largest oil company in the world, took me to court because I dared say that ENI needed to change its business plan. Otherwise, all oil reserves would become, would become stranded assets. And I said that during the stock exchange operating hours, they accuse me of being um, of manipulating, you know, the, the, the value of stocks. And I had to go to court to defend myself as a minister. They're not soft on us at all, because some of them realize how transformative some of these ideas are. But the good thing is that those ideas then became more and more popular because a lot of people saw them as positive ways of going forward. And, and then some businesses had to start accept, accepting them. The war is not over, actually, it's just begun. And probably e and I at the end will, will, will prevail. But what I'm trying to say is that, I, and I may be wrong, but I see this as a way of um, making the emperor naked and, and as a way of winning the business argument with recalcitrant business and, and infiltrating them more than being co-opted. But of course, the jury is out. Maybe it won't work this way. Um, again, let's always try to look at history. What has worked in the past? If it didn't work then, how are we sure that we're going to work now with those concepts um, when society has fundamentally changed? Okay. Thank you. Um, can I just com probably comment? I think there is enough space for 
like different voices and most many of the uh, of the things that you say uh, were uh, somehow formulated in the 70s and also in the digital movement. So I don't see like a strong con opposition between more radical ideas in our group and in general, uh, like what, what Ben was saying in terms of we have to act into the political economy sphere that I, I agree as well. But I think we should also create alliances, as uh, Lorenzo oh, yeah. the most important point is that we need everything in this battle. We need like more radical people to talking about how we can possibly change our social structure, but also like a different uh, variety, different like uh, on, on the spectrum, different variety of, of way of uh, strategically approaching uh, yeah. politics. Can I, can I add something, Mario? I also want to make clear, um, you know, because this is an academic conversation, um, I'm highlighting the differences so that I get, get a sense, I help you understand the extent to which you know, we are, it, it, my talk is relevant to you, right? If I was just repeating what we have in common, you would say, okay, fine. It's, but obviously, as Mario said, our, all these strains of work have got more in common than they, than they have in terms of disagreement. And I think it's very useful to have them because where one succeeds, maybe the other one will not and, and so on and so forth. But also when we talk about radical, also radical is in the eye of the beholder. I don't know how many of you have come across a lot of work that has been done in terms of, you know, challenging growth from a mindfulness perspective, right? There's a whole literature on our growth obsession coming from our psychological needs. And so many of the monks and the mindful, you know, mindfulness um, practitioners argue that they are the radicals, that you are not, I am not, because we don't practice mindfulness. We talk about it, but we are not in balance ourselves. So you see, they, they believe they're the real radicals and, and some of our you know bourgeois colleagues that use computers and chat over Zoom are not. So it's also important to 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 recognize that we all think we're radical, right? You know, I think I'm radical because I became a minister. So if, if you can become a minister and have these ideas, I mean, I can have more impact than someone that doesn't become a minister. The guy that practices mindfulness thinks he's more radical because his, his, psych, his psychological sphere is more in touch with his values than, than us. You, some of you may think they're more radical because they take to the streets, but maybe after that, they go watch a Netflix movie or something, I don't know. So it's, we all think we're radical in different ways. And, and I think it's important to expand this, this recognition um, to things that um, we haven't perhaps considered as important uh, yet. Um, I believe that mindfulness practitioners are in many ways the most radical of all. Um, but and but guess but guess what? How many of them have been co-opted into this capitalist system? You know, uh, they they publish books and the books sell millions of copies, and everyone is practicing practicing mindfulness, and then does nothing with it. It becomes a fashion. You know, it becomes just a uh, something trendy. Um, and and so anyway, I just wanted to to highlight the fact that even being radical is subjective. Javier, yeah. um, thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you for the for the talk. Uh, I agree with you that the idea of well-being travels better than others because it's very hard to oppose well-being, right? You cannot be against well-being without being seen as like somewhat somebody irrational, right? How can you oppose well-being? So I agree with that. To me, the problem is that when you when you come to the next stage of the travel, is that you have to convince people that your understanding of well-being and if I understand what you said is measure as health, social cohesion and environment is compatible and resonates with the way citizens, people understand well-being, which I think in many ways is probably very, very different. So to me, the problem is to make this translation there. Like, I'm not sure to what extent people will perceive as well-being the idea that health, healthcare, for example, is, is uh, made available, the society is more cohesive, or the environment is more is better protected. I could agree with you that objectively, these are you know reasonable well-being indicators. Whether, how do you make the majority of people perceive that as adding to their individual well-being? 
and something like they can benefit from it's a different it's a very different thing because i think the way many people understand well-being today is not necessarily linked to these three factors so my question to you is how do you think you can make this translation then? well this is a very good question and it speaks to one of the main issues that we've been facing uh, over the past decade um, there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion within the well-being economy front. Um, I am convinced that we should stick to um, objective understanding of well-being, right? That's why I mentioned we put together, you know, all the medical research that is available out there and, and, and the biological research and so on and so forth. But more or less, you know, they all say that our, our well-being as a person, I could be living in South Africa, in the North Pole, I could be believing in God or not, on any other form of deity, uh, but my well-being is an outcome of, not my happiness, okay? Because I never, I didn't say happiness once, okay? I'm not talking about mm -hmm. happiness. That's a totally different realm. Talking uh, my well-being is an outcome of personal health, and personal health is dependent on the quality of social connections and natural ecosystems. That's, that's how our bodies function. Now, um, so, and I, my sense, and I may be wrong here, but my sense has always been, if we stick to science, if we stick to what is accepted through scientific evidence, we have a strong argument that we're not proposing some subjective idea that is in line with Lorenzo today, tomorrow it's gonna be Mario's idea, and then who knows what, what else. Because remember, our objective, our goal is to defeat economic growth, which is seen as objective, although it's not, but it's perceived as objective and as quantifiable with something that if it's too soft, too lofty, will be defeated. Okay, so I need to prove that that something I want to replace it with is actually scientifically sound. Some other colleagues disagree with me. Some other colleagues believe that the well-being revolution should lead towards a new economic system that is adaptable to any culture. So they argue, and there is some truth in this that I, that I share, um, they argue that one of the problems with growth and with the GDP model is that it has universalized something that shouldn't be universal, that people in Spain or in your region should be free to pursue economic prosperity according to their own goals that could be very different from how economic prosperity is pursued in Norway or is pursued in Malawi. That they think that one of the main um negative out, probably the main negative outcome overall of the obsession with growth is it, it is that it has standardized progress it has standardized success and success is different from place to place from culture to culture i could be you know we've always taught our children that everyone develops according to his or her personal skills and objectives right we teach kids that you're good in your own way. That kid is good in his own way. The other kid is good in his own way. But then when it comes to the economy, the economies have to be good in the same way. And many argue that this is this is wrong. And we should probably enter an era in which there is not one single way of measuring economic success. In each and every country can actually decide what to do and how to do it and how to measure the attainment of those goals. And I'm actually quite intrigued by this. And I think it may very well happen in the future. I don't see any reason why we should compare um, Thailand with uh, with uh, Fiji. You know, why do I need to compare which one is more developed? Who, who gives a shit? I mean, like, why can't they be developed in different ways, right? So I, I'm not obsessed with you know comparing countries. It's comparing apples and oranges in many ways. However. I believe that if at the outset of this revolution we were to say that this is what we wanted to do, we would be probably undermining the credibility of our proposition. Um, again, we are fighting against an enemy that has a number of technological, technical, academic ammunition that we don't have. If we go there with a concept that is too vague, it's too subjective, it's adaptable, um, it's different in Rome and it's different in Milan and then Paris does it in a different way and then Germany or maybe a sub-region in Germany will do it differently. I, I fear that this may eventually undermine its policy impact. So I'm not against this, but I think in the space of the battle, you need to be as scientifically and evidence-based, uh, as scientifically sound and evidence-based as possible. Great. Any other questions? 
Okay, so maybe I have a last question that is linked to uh, the last uh, topic of discussion. Uh, we have uh, another project that is called Just Transition to Circular Economy, and uh, we have our friends from the UCT, University of Cape Town, working with us. Um, just to connect you with what you, you just said, uh, I, I don't know if you're still like a, you are still a professor in Pretoria, no? you're still, you're going there and yeah, teaching. Yeah. And there is a huge debate about decolonizing knowledge and decolonizing um, science and education in South Africa. And next week we will be in, in Coimbra, where uh, the Sosa Santos uh, created this, uh, this center to us to study uh, uh, different epistemologies, and he wrote this book, Epistemology of the South. I, I want to know if you are engaged in this, uh, in this uh, debate in South Africa, and uh, what is the discussion about well-being economics? Uh, economy in, in South Africa? Well, the discussion is pretty advanced. Uh, we all has a group in, in South Africa as well. Um, my first book was published in South Africa in 2017. That's where it all started. And there's a whole reflection around the cultural values of Southern African countries, the whole idea of collective well-being, Ubuntu and so on and so forth, that is very traditionally grounded in, in South Africa. I'm engaged with um, this whole conversation debate around um, decolonizing, you know, the culture, the academic curriculum, and the education system in, in South Africa and in the rest of Africa, which I think is a very important debate. I'm not always convinced that it's 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 done um, with a real transformative approach, right? It's it's becoming a bit of a of a buzzword, you know, decolonizing. Uh, you know, you don't need to decolonize the academic curriculum by rejecting Western philosophy, you know, like and you need to you need to start exploring uh, African philosophies and African cultures. But it's not just by doing a way that you that you you will embrace your own uh, your own way of doing things. One of my criticisms is that often those those that are very vocal on decolonizing the cultural, um, the African culture are those that are very fond of some of these Western tools every day. You know, um, uh, uh, the South African president is obsessed with GDP, but he talks about decolonizing. You know, the, the col he doesn't know that GDP has been invented somewhere else. It's got nothing to do with the African culture. So, and and it, rather than saying what well, we need to start by calling into question some of the things we've internalized, it seems that you can just. Uh, you know, pretend that you're changing something in the books and then continue using the tools that actually make a difference in every in everyday life. Um, um, one of the one of the main arguments that I've raised with them has got to do with the energy policy, right? If you're so keen on decolonizing your 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 approach, why don't you call into question all the things that you have done in terms of energy that have got nothing to do with the cultural as well as the environmental characteristics of the country. I mean, continue, consider that South Africa is producing a minor part of its energy through uh, solar and most of it through coal and and uh, and in partly nuclear, which has got nothing to do with, you know, an, an indigenous autonomous approach to energy production. It's got nothing to do with uh, their car obsessed, uh, you know, and that's also, you know, something that I've completely imported. And often this is just entre new. Often some of the colleagues, my colleagues that are very big on decolonizing curriculum were Armani clothing and, and drive a, a German car, you know. So it's 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 my 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 sense is that if it doesn't get to the deep strata of what it means, it becomes another fashion parade, you know, another superficial cosmetic conversation to replace a stupid book written by European with a stupid book written by an African author. The stupid books are stupid books no matter what the author is. Okay. Anything more? No. So I uh, repeat, thank you very much, Lorenzo, for thank you. being with us. And uh, we want to informally invite you here in Pontevedra, maybe in spring if you want, in summer with your family. And they show how convivial wow, our group is. I can see that already. Yeah, it's a very beautiful setting <laughs> and very open and, and space. We invite you to a cup of good wine. We have the best white wines in in the world in Galicia. And uh, and maybe if they uh, give us the opportunity to organize the next uh, of conference, uh, maybe we can uh, discuss the possibility of having you as a keynote or 
organize an event on the well-being economy with sure. you. Thank you, Mario. It's been a pleasure and uh, good luck with the project. And um, yeah, good luck to the students and those. Um, uh, I don't think I see all of you. I think there is part of you that I don't see there. I don't know if to the left there are more people. How can you see? No, you can see everyone. Oh, yeah, I can see everyone. Okay. And um, thank you for your questions and uh, good luck with your studies. Okay. And good luck for uh, your battles in the parliaments. They continue and, every day. On Italian media. <laughs> non stop. They can be very mean. Do you mind if you uh, if we um, uh, circulate our and we, we um, circulate our uh, your video on our channels? It's fine. It's fine. Okay. It's public okay. domain. Okay. okay. Fantastic. Ciao. Cheers. Ciao. Bye bye. Ciao. 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 Ciao.